Hello, and welcome to this RCR wireless webinar entitled Smart Money, How Smart Cities Could Drive More Than $20 Trillion in Economic Benefits by 2026. Thank you for joining us. This 60-minute webinar brings together a panel of industry experts from Cordon and Interdigital Business, ABI Research, US Ignite, and the City of Atlanta to explore the role of smart cities for economic development. Specific areas include technological drivers for economic growth and smart urban economy, economic indicators and effects of smart city IoT investments on GDP, implementation, guidelines, and operationalization checklists for city governments, and more. My name is Ben Sohn, and I'm the Client Services Manager with RCR Wireless News. I'd like to take a few minutes to review some housekeeping items with our audience before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the Zoom webinar interface. This webinar will be recorded and available to everyone who's registered for this webinar at the end of the on demand, at the end on demand, and you will receive an email when it's available for viewing. It will also be available to download for anyone who's unable to attend today. Please submit your questions through the Q and A feature on the webinar platform and indicate the panelists you'd like to ask your question to, and we'll take questions at the end. Now allow me to introduce you to today's speakers and get this webinar started. Today we'll be joined by Kirk Talbot of the City of Atlanta, Dominique Bonte of ABI Research, Bill McGuire of US Ignite, and Mika Rzingas of Cordon. Now I'd like to pass it over to Dominique Bonte to kick us off. Thanks, Ben, and hello everybody. It's a really a pleasure to participate in this webinar. So in this first part, what I would like to do is uh, pro uh, present the main findings of the white paper. Uh, ABI did, it's available for download on the Interdigital website, so feel free to download it. And spend the next 10 minutes or so in uh, kind of summarizing kind of what we, what we did there. So I, I'm kind of gonna start with some more general comments about how the, the role of cities is evolving. I really see this centered around uh, three kind of uh, dimensions. I think first and foremost, because you know we talk about technology here, it's pretty obvious that cities continue to be and will even be more so the centers uh, uh, where next generation technology is deployed. Whether you think about 5G or uh, low power wide area, uh, kind of connectivity roadside center uh, sensors, all the way to maybe wireless EV charging infrastructure and, and microgrids, it's all going to happen in cities. And maybe it will only ever happen in cities because that's where we can find uh, economies of scale to do it. And that technology, of course, is used to drive what I would call urban use cases from driverless car sharing, uh, personal airborne transportation, AI-based surveillance is what will be made possible uh, with uh, these technologies. So looking beyond technology, it's of course, and this is the major topic of this uh, webinar, of course, it's cities as the future growth engines for the economy of the future. And I'll, you know, the way we kind of describe this in the white paper is as the new smart urban economy. I'll come back to that in, into more detail. But just for kind of introducing this, it's really about moving you know, beyond the holy trinity of connectivity, uh, sensors and analytics, to you know have next generation technologies you can think blockchain and demand response and things like that to drive the sharing the crowdsourced and distributed economy paradigms of the future so for example blockchain will enable smart contracts for e-trade and freight we see the energy sector uh, dramatically change in terms of adopting crowdsourcing and crowdfunding paradigms as well. So again, I'll, I'll come back to that in, in one of the next slides. And then finally, the third element, and I think it's a very important one, is uh, you know, cities are becoming more important from a political perspective, the power they have, the influence they can uh, exert. And in many cases, and increasingly, I would say, they are now seen as you know, the first and maybe the only level of government which is going to address the challenges of the future. You can think about a sustainable economic development. You can also think about the fight against poverty through digital inclusion, of course, also the fight uh, against crime. They're also increasingly involved in rolling out and managing very complex and critical infrastructure. So, so all of this actually put cities at the forefront of, of the action here. 
So uh, can we have the next slide, please? So let's dive into the heart of the matter here. And, you know, first of all, uh, maybe look at, you know, how important is economic development as, as a benefit for smart cities deployments. And it kind of sits, uh, I would say, at the top of a hierarchy of benefits. Uh, we have livability, cost savings, cost of living, safety, security, resilience, and then sustainability. And it's actually interesting how there's like mutual reinforcement between you know, the four I just mentioned and then the econo economic development. I think in a way, economic development both depends on livability, uh, cost of living to attract the right kind of businesses, the, the right kind of employees, but uh, in the other way around, those also uh, boost economic development uh, as well. So it's, it's really very much linked in a way you know, you could say that uh, economic development is the ultimate objective of a smart city deployment. And unfortunately, it's not always very well understood yet and certainly not much talked about it. But I think hopefully, you know, we can help uh, increasing awareness about the importance of economic development. And it, it's so important because there's a lot of, you know, fighting symptoms going on, like putting cameras out there for, for safety and security. You know, by focusing more on economic development, we can find alternative ways to fight crime. A, a prosperous city will have less crime, will be, you know, have all the other benefits as well. So it's kind of the balance between the soft and the hard benefits. And I think it's very important to, you know, for city governments to be aware of that. So then how, what can a city government do to boost uh, the, the economy? And of course, obviously create a business friendly environment, uh, uh, tax-friendly environment, uh, legislation, regulation, or some of the things cities can do. It's, of course, also important to have an innovation-friendly climate linked with R&D universities, uh, availability of flexible uh, risk capital, uh, education, the availability of a skilled workforce, for, uh, for sure, as well, availability, quality, and affordability of basic services to attract both employees and uh, enterprises, that's very much what we discussed in the, the previous webinar uh, related to cost savings. And then of course, safety, security, sustainability, and political stability. It's, it's pretty obvious that, um, you know, uh, a city that don't take, uh, uh, put attention on that will struggle to maintain uh, economic growth as well. So let's move now to some uh, metrics here. Uh, we, we are still on the previous slide, yeah, thanks. So we see kind of different levels of tech-driven urban economic development. There's uh, quick wins and there's more structural approaches. So the first one here is, you know, open platforms, data policies, and um, uh, marketplaces. The, the very fact of just opening, uh, you know, platforms and making data available to third-party developers and, and enterprises in its own uh, creates uh, uh, additional economic growth. I think London is a good example. Transport for London has made some statements on that. Simply by opening up their platform to the, uh, the wider ecosystem, uh, they could see uh, good growth uh, already happening. We estimate that this would, would amount to around a trillion dollar over the next decade. And that's a global number. So pretty small, but don't forget, this is immediate effect and, and a quick win. The next level really, and, and a very important one, is about the multiplicator effect of public investment. It's a very well uh, studied topic here that every dollar invested by governments has a multiplicator effect in terms of investment uh, in the private sector. We estimate that factor to evolve to you know, a factor of 10 towards the end of that decade uh, as, as we move forward, uh, forward. So over the next decade, this effect alone will create incremental GDP of uh, close to uh, $10 trillion. And then the next level, and that's actually what I would call the end game of smart cities, and that's where we talk about uh, smart, the smart urban economy. This is really about fueling structural growth, uh, and I'll come back to that uh, right in the next slide, uh, to have sustainable economic growth over and beyond the linkage to public investment. All these effects combined represent a net uh, incremental GDP growth of 5%. 
which is uh, you know pretty impressive. The next slide, please. So the new smart urban economy, because that's where we're aiming for. And, and the way I would like to talk about this uh, is along three dimensions. So the first one on the left-hand side really is about you know, the new urban economy. We all heard about the sharing economy, the on-demand economy, crowdsourcing, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized approaches for energy and transportation. It's an all-in economy. Uh, and it's also an autonomous and intelligent economy. So we're looking at a very you know, uh, not just reorganizing the economy, but actually reinventing it. So how can we do that? Well, we need some technology paradigms for that. And of course, AI, robotics, automation is very important. Airborne mobility, blockchain, smart infrastructure, e-government, uh, fintech demand response are all in that category of enabling these new economic paradigms. And then on the right-hand side, uh, very important as well, of course, or the uh, business uh, paradigm. So this is about, you know, closing the loop across the verticals. It's about cognitive uh, self-governing uh, entities, micropayments between machines, dynamic pricing, and I think maybe the most important one of all, global market transparency, which in itself uh, is a very important driver uh, of uh, economic growth. So the way you, you, you might want to describe this is that you know, these new financial instruments will be critical, critical for organizing trusted interaction, interactions between an increasing number of actors in, in these new economies. Uh, where decentralized, disintermediated peer-to-peer -peer transactions in meshed environments in frictionless cross-vertical collaboration and commerce will result in you know, an, an explosion in, in the type of interactions and, of course, in turn, driving uh, economic growth. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is all very nice in terms of the theoretical background and the technological background, but, of course, you know, to make this happen, to implement this is almost as important. Uh, so I think what a city sh should do first and foremost when, you know, building a, a smart city strategy is first and foremost take into account the econo economic development uh, uh, benefit or objective. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, not everybody has really understood how important this is. And then in the wake of that, you know, look at, uh, you know, and every city is different. Um, so every city need to do kind of a SWOT analysis of, you know, what are the strengths and the weaknesses? What are the kind of inhibitors for economic development? There could be a lack of, uh, you know, employees or education or financing. It could be just anything that really depends on the city. Uh, it's also about formulating both quick win strategies and longer term structural approaches. I think both are important. And it's of course about allocated funding and prioritizing resources. Equally important we think is work on a more frictionless engagement with the supplier ecosystem. And there has been a lot of frustration within the private industry working with cities and governments in general is very hard. You know, city governments need to make it more easy to do business with them, uh, kind of easier to uh, you know, negotiate RFP processes is just one element. But also I think in terms of organization, they need to be organized more horizontally, uh, breaking through the, the currently still uh, present fragmentation uh, across the departments uh, of, of a certain city. And then finally, I think, you know, uh, thinking about economic development in terms of the many uh, variations. You know, two I want to mention here is regional variability. There's certainly a big difference between developed regions and developing regions. For example, in terms of infrastructure, uh, developed regions need to think about managing aging infrastructure, maybe thinking about replacement, whereas developing regions really should start building smart infrastructure for, from scratch. In terms of city size, I think that's another very important kind of uh, parameter. Uh, for large mega cities, I would say mainly in developed regions, there's a lot of uh, competition. So there it's very important. Cities you know, do all the things we talked about so far uh, to remain competitive on an economic dimension, both on the short term and the longer term. For smaller urban centers, I think it's important to you know, embrace maybe uh, even more so quick wins and uh, avoiding, uh, you know, uh, large investments. The, uh, 
resources for which might not be available anyway. So for them, I think it's very important to think about open data policies, thinking about what they can do with the sharing economy, and uh, in that way, uh, demonstrating uh, uh, ROI, uh, awaiting you know, approval for more uh, structural uh, projects. So I think I want to I want to leave it here, and of course we have time for Q and A. So I'll pass it to Bill here. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Bill McGuire, and on behalf of US Ignite, I'm thrilled to join this webinar and share our organization's experience supporting the development of what we call community innovation ecosystems. And as Don mentioned, it's hard to believe with the buzz surrounding the topic of smart cities that anything about this topic can be underreported or underappreciated. But I do agree with the ABI study and its conclusion that there is a need for data that validates the not yet fully recognized link between investments in smart and connected community projects and economic development. More to follow on this point, but I, I think it's a great contribution that the ABI study makes. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about US Ignite. We're a nonprofit organization. We were established six years ago. Uh, at that time, our founding mission was to work with communities to de develop applications that make use of the newly emerging gigabit broadband networks. Of course, given the pace of technological change, it can be difficult to remember that uh, a time when telecom providers were not advertising the value of gigabit connections. My, uh, my favorite ad recently has been Comcast ad imploring customers to get giggy with it. Um, but that, it, you know, when we were found at US Ignite, in the early days, we did not yet know what access to an advanced network, uh, telecom network would mean, particularly what it would mean for communities. We have a better sense of that now. A lot of the activities uh, for which communities can, will, and are utilizing advanced networks relate to smart and connected community objectives, uh, sort of under this smart city umbrella. So at, at US Ignite, we see the advanced networks as a key ingredient uh, Dom referred to the, the trinity, the holy trinity of the smart city space, the connectivity, the sensors, and then the analytics. Uh, and for us, that network component uh, is sort of the foundation that allows the rest of it to come together. But it's not the only ingredient uh, to what we call the development of a community innovation ecosystem. Indeed, we think that the development of these ecosystems is both the opportunity and the promise of all of the buzz that surrounds smart city. The buzz to, to us creates the opportunity for cities to invest in and develop these innovation ecosystems, but it's a thriving ecosystem that will allow communities to be nimble and agile and respond to all of the exciting opportunities, many of which Dom mentioned. Uh, that will uh, become possible uh, and benefit from all of the positive externalities, including economic development that come as a result. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. Okay, so how does a small nonprofit, we have a staff less than 20, seek to have an impact developing these community innovation ecosystems? So the first answer is partnerships. Um, our targets for partnership include Municipal, municipalities themselves, industry partners, and universities. Uh, we've partnered with more than 100 uh, in uh, around three programs. So answer number two about how we, uh, how we work to have an impact is by de designing programs that, are, that uh, address specific friction points that sort of slow progress in this space. Uh, so in the remainder of my time, what I'd like to do is outline three of our primary programs, the Smart Gigabit Communities Program, the US Ignite Forum, and the Platform for Advanced Wireless Research. Next slide, please. So the Smart Gigabit Communities Program is, uh, I guess, uh, our flagship program. It's 25 partner communities, uh, 24 of which are in the US, and uh, we recently announced our first partnership outside of the US with Adelaide, Australia. Uh, you'll see from the slide that um, uh, cities of a variety of different sizes are part of the um, uh, program. 
cities in rural areas, cities in urban areas. Um, we find that all of these communities uh, can benefit from the, from the program. Next slide, please. So there, uh, sort of, I mentioned earlier the, the ingredients to this uh, community uh, innovation ecosystem. And so in the far left-hand corner, you'll see the infrastructure that we do believe is sort of a key component. Um, below that is the innovation ecosystem. Uh, to the right are champions, and then in the far right-hand corner, uh, bottom right-hand corner, of course, the advanced applications. All of these uh, pieces, we believe, need to be there for the innovation ecosystem to be agile and robust. Uh, US Ignite in our program, the Smart Gigabit Communities Program, we establish steering committees in each of the communities. We have regular meetings. We uh, establish best practices about the sort of organizations that should be represented in your steering committee to include multiple different departments within a municipality, community anchor institutions like libraries and public safety entities, uh, chambers of commerce. Uh, importantly, we do much work to foster relationships between uh, municipalities and what we call an application development ecosystems, um, students, professors, entrepreneurs. Um, we do so through a variety of different uh, challenges and reverse pitches and hackathons. Um, and what we find is these sorts of engagements this sort of uh, clustering, if you will, uh, is indeed the, uh, uh, the secret sauce to preparing your uh, community. So it's the technical piece, but it's also the uh, social piece. Next slide, please. So we've had some success. We measure our success by the number of applications and we're, uh, that have been developed through the process. Uh, we're over 120. Uh, there are a variety of different applications. Um, Don mentioned the SWOT analysis. We encourage all of the communities to look at the assets that they have in the community, look at uh, areas of sort of competitive advantage. We also ask them uh, to consider, you know, challenges that they have um, that are particular to that community. Um, so uh, the applications themselves are developed to meet particular city's needs, but all of them have the elements necessary to be uh, readily uh, replicable uh, in the other communities that are part of the SGC. So the product, these applications, are uh, one measure, but the process is also another measure. You know, how, how well these, these uh, steering committees are working, um, are they, uh, using these steering committees, the communities to respond to grant applications? Are they winning those grant applications? Uh, we find that the answer generally is yes and yes. Next slide, please. Um, it's important to talk a little bit about kind of the um, movement in this space. It start, the SGC community started as a, a federally funded program through NSF. And indeed, a number of the cities that are participating in the program do so with the support of NSF. But increasingly, we see communities that are participating uh, either paying their own way, uh, self-funding their participation, uh, or it's, uh, developing a partnership with an organization that sponsors their participation. Um, this suggests to us, and hopefully it uh, uh, makes sense to everyone in the audience, that we're seeing a lot of uh, a growing appreciation of the fact that these sorts of efforts are really critical to uh, the, the benefits that we all see from these smart city deployments. Next slide, please. Okay, so our second program is called the US Ignite Forum. Um, if there are uh, sort of two words that have a mixed reputation in the smart city space, in my opinion, uh, those words are pilot program. They certainly have, uh, pilots certainly have a very important role to play. Um, they establish the ROI, they provide an opportunity for effective stakeholder engagement within the community. Uh, but I think there is some fatigue and uh, municipal leaders and their industry partners alike are looking for opportunities to scale. 
uh, and they're very excited about those opportunities to move to scale. So with the forum, we've created an opportunity for community, city to city sharing that we believe helps make the release of RFIs, RFPs, and PPPs easier. Um, as Dom mentioned, next slide please, there is uh, no city is, is alike. Um, so what we think the forum provides is an opportunity for cities to uh, learn from one another, ask questions in some depth. Um, so we, we convene a, a discussion around a specific topic, uh, and then we write a playbook uh, the first of those playbooks uh, focused on smart lighting and smart sensor deployments um, uh, is on our website. But um, the quote from uh, uh, Chicago's chief information officer suggests to us that while cities very much appreciate the opportunity to learn from one another, those opportunities aren't as uh, readily available as I had imagined. Um, and there needs to be uh, substantive engagement so that there's an opportunity to understand which pieces of particular projects can be replicated and which pieces need to be uh, you know, sort of developed uh, anew for a city. Next, please. Um, I just wanted to quickly give a, a shout out to the um, organizations that are sponsoring the forum. Again, I think this is a sign that there's a lot of interest in moving towards the sort of scale that Don mentions, um, both within city leadership and within the industry partners. Next slide, please. Quick shout out to the, so the third key program at US Ignite, um, the Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research. Uh, it's a program that US Ignite administers with Northeastern University. That's a $50 million grant from NSF and $50 million of cash and in kind from an industry uh, consortium. Um, this effort, the reason that we highlight it, uh, points to a friction point or an opportunity really uh, for a lot of communities to think about how they can become a test bed, how they can make available their facilities, their geography, uh, as a, a way to test some of these new technologies. This, of course, in the platforms for advanced wireless technology, or what wireless research power is in the uh, wireless research space, uh, but we see examples in connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, US Ignite, we see many opportunities in resilience and emergency response uh, as, as areas where uh, communities can become test beds, and this can be a catalyzing feature. Um, you know, if the SWOT analysis of a municipality is not yet uh, clarified, areas in which you know it will focus, um, we encourage thought about how to become uh, or support um, a development of uh, sort of a innovation sandbox. Next slide, please. And these are the organizations that support the Power Initiative. Again, showing the sort of broad uh, support across industry um, for these initiatives to develop uh, a, a new wireless uh, research platform. Uh, I'll say that yesterday we announced uh, the first two uh, of four. Uh, new York and Salt Lake City are the uh, first two cities that will receive uh, these advanced wireless research platforms under the Power Program. Final slide, please. Here is our contact information to learn more. Uh, I'll encourage you to uh, visit the US Ignite website. I'm certainly happy to respond to any questions via email. Um, and I, uh, as I close, like to thank Cordon for putting on this webinar uh, and for and InterDigital for their support uh, for US Ignite and our programs. We're thrilled to participate and we look forward to the rest of the presentations and the Q&A to follow. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm Mika Rasinkangas. I'm uh, representing Cordant uh, Interdigital's IoT business. And then if you uh, think of the uh, ABI research bit where we started this, uh, uh, this webinar, there was a discussion about this, uh, this opening up data and bringing data available. Uh, so basically, that's the scope that we are in in, uh, in, uh, in the IoT business, if you will, and in the, in the smart city space. 
So um, we're now uh, diving into a specific solution and uh, I'll uh, discuss about uh, our one transport solution, if uh, then if you move to the next slide. So basically, um, I'll talk about the history of our one transport, uh, how that has started, how that has evolved, uh, where that is today, and how that's being applied on a specific uh, a smart city or event management use cases. Uh, next slide, please. So as a starting point, we started One Transport as a UK government sponsored uh, project, uh, working together with, uh, with four local authorities in the UK, basically counties who manage the transportation needs for the counties as well as with, uh, with some universities and other industry partners to look at the problem statement of uh, all these different parties having siloed data, data in different areas that was not really coming together anywhere. And uh, uh, with that, these counties and people who manage particularly the transportation aspects of it we're having a lot of different kinds of issues and, uh, and needs to, uh, to better uh, utilize what they knew that they had, or to an extent they knew that they had, but it was just not coming together. So we built a, uh, a solution called One Transport, where we basically aggregate real-time data from various different sources, uh, bring it into a single environment and expose it, make it available for different kinds of services. So this started in 2015 as this sort of consortium and activity. And then uh, last year, 2017, was the last year of the project during which we kept on building the solution towards a full-blown real-time data marketplace solution. And if we move to the next slide, so what is a real-time data marketplace? So one transport, first of all, it's a, it's a technical solution. So it's a cloud-based software solution that's built on an open one end to end global standard. It's built to aggregate or bring in specifically real-time data from different systems. But then uh, a lot of people think about, um, think about IoT or think about smart cities, um, people have this idea of, of all these fancy new sensors and new types of, uh, types of data. But that's not really the reality because there's a whole host of legacy systems out there and the vast majority of the data sources that we deal with are different kinds of legacy systems where data comes from. So in one transport, we bring together all these, uh, uh, all these uh, legacy data sources as well as different new, new data sources. So it brings all this data together and makes it available. Uh, for, for different services or different companies to utilize. So on top of the technical side, uh, one transport as a, as a data marketplace also includes the legal aspects, which means the, uh, the license terms. So different entities, be it public sector entities or private companies, they are willing to share their data, but, uh, but with different uh, different terms, if you will. So in the UK case, typically public sector entities want to open up their data and they rely on open government license to, uh, to, uh, to do that. So we make that available. But then private companies, more often than not, they want to charge a fee for the data that they make available. And in order to enable that in one transport data marketplace, there's two aspects to it. One is, um, is first the legal side of it, so you need to have a suitable license terms to do that. And then another one is, uh, is a technical side of it, so you need to be able to, uh, 
he will set the price for the data that uh, that you publish through one transport. So we enable all that. And there's a uh, different roles that users have when they utilize one transport uh, as a system. So I mentioned these local authorities with whom we started one transport as a project. So these are typically uh, raw data publishers. So they uh, they publish their data or make their data available to, to one transport. But at the same time, they are also data consumers. So they, they use their own data through one transport because as a system, one transport brings it all together from, uh, from different disparate systems. Then there's a role for typically specialized companies like data cleansing. So raw data has uh, differing amounts of value. I mean, some of it's more valuable than, uh, than, than other types, but typically you can improve the value of the data in different ways by like cleansing it. So there's a role for this kind of enhancers who can enhance the raw data and then uh, put it back or make it available again in an improved form to one transport. And then, um, then there's, uh, there's publishers, typically private companies or companies um, as well as um, as consumers of the uh, so companies really put raw data in what they focus on is uh, they might want to sell some of the quality data or they might want to utilize quality data from uh, from different companies point being that you can overlay different types of data sets and yield more insights out of it and that's really the whole point of one transport system that when you have all kinds of different data sets together it yields to more data driven uh, innovative solutions that people can then utilize uh, out from the from the system so that's the um, that's what the solution is and then if we move to the next slide um, Talking about the specific solution where one transport has been used in the, in the UK. So uh, Silverstone Circuit is a, is a really large uh, motor racing venue and uh, there's, a, there's a whole host of uh, silo services that are being delivered um, uh, during, before, during and after events. Next slide, please. What the, what the venue owners at Silverstone, just as well as anywhere where you, where you hold large events or you operate large venues, people are looking at more holistic experiences where basically, on one hand, you are looking at the user experience, starting from, uh, from before the event, from purchasing of the tickets, all the way to getting back home from the event that has a whole host of different kinds of aspects aspects where the experience can be improved by utilization of uh, of different kinds of uh, kind of data but then also the venue owners event organizers want to look at the look at the profitability side of things that how do i make my operations as efficient as possible and how do I make them as profitable as possible with the best possible user experience I can deliver? Next slide, please. So with this, uh, since uh, Silverstone Circuit sits uh, on, a, on an area of two different local authorities with whom we've been working for a number of years, as well as the UK's Highway Art Authority, Highways England, so we started from the transportation side to uh, to help uh, help Silverstone and the, uh, the related local authorities to better manage the uh, uh, the traffic inflows and outflows for the event, as well as the parking arrangements there, because it is an extremely large venue and uh, the the data. Uh, that uh, that all the different parties had 
was, uh, was basically in a different silos with the different local authorities, with highways inland and with, uh, uh, with the Silverstone as, uh, as an entity. So we brought all that together, the to one transport uh, uh, solution, and that uh, with that helped uh, all the related parties to, to better manage the transportation aspects of it. And now what we are doing is we are basically moving forward from there, building more and more use cases and a more holistic um, uh, and improved uh, user experience for the venue. Next slide, please. So we are focusing, uh, focusing uh, still on the transportation aspects, improving what we are doing and, uh, and moving from there but then also putting a more holistic effort on this user experience with an application or mobile app based solution where you can, uh, let's say, uh, better arrange your visit for the venue and, uh, and moving forward from there. The next slide, please. So, um, so this Comes to, it comes down to where I started when talking about this venue solution. So it's really all about uh, all about the uh, uh, better user experience uh, through and through, from uh, uh, from starting your journey all the way to, to back out from the event, as well as the organizer's perspective of how do I improve the, the ROI, how do I make uh, make the event. Uh, better for me, but also for the surrounding areas. Like in the case of Silverstone, it's in a rather rural area and uh, the, the traffic uh, disturbances that events cause there has impact for the surrounding areas and, uh, and uh, those can be better managed with this sort of a uh, data center solution, if you will. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'll... Um, I'll conclude there and uh, hand over to Kevin. Thank you very much, Mika. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Kirk Talbot. I'm the executive director for the, <clears throat> pardon me, City of Atlanta's uh, Smart City Program. We, we call it Smart ATL. And the City of Atlanta has been working in this space for about two and a half years, um, attempting to flush out a lot of what you've already heard about in terms of economic development opportunities. Um, and I won't repeat a lot of what the previous commenters or pe previous panelists have discussed because uh, they're actually spot on. Um, as Dom mentioned, um, I think economic development from cities will come from multiple fronts. Uh, within Atlanta, we are exploring multiple avenues towards uh, economic growth. We have, um, we have an external agency that we work with, a sister agency, and I think this is really critical for a lot of the cities that are making progress in this for the exact same reasons that Dom mentioned. But we have an external uh, city agency that we call Invest Atlanta uh, that's an economic development arm. And when you understand what drives cities that uh, they've grown up over multiple centuries to provide safe, reliable services to the, the people that live and work and uh, travel through the city, you start to understand that the, the factors that drive a city's success historically to this point have encouraged cities to be risk avoiders. Um, and what we're seeing now with this emerging opportunity in economic development is that cities and the communities that they're comprised of have to be experimental. They have to be um, challenging the business paradigms, as mentioned, and they have to try a bunch of new things. Um, we're definitely sensitive, uh, as I think uh, Bill talked about, that cities are becoming tired of the experimental and pilot phase. But as we've seen um, in our efforts, the, the vendor solutions that are out there are intriguing, but they're still very experimental themselves. We haven't gotten to a phase of this where deployments are guaranteed to have returns of investment that uh, are predictable, consistent, and um, warrantable, which is something that civic leaders would love to be able to get to. 
Um, and so consequently, cities have to figure out what is that combination of technologies? What is that combination of sensors and, and connectivity and analytics look like that will address those challenges that they have? Um, so it, it, it has to be understood, and this is something that is not fully woven into the way cities are thinking about it yet, but uh, solutions in this space are inherently experimental at this phase. What's interesting though, and I, I really liked what uh, Dom said about why cities are probably so well positioned for this, is cities inherently in their charter are to facilitate a better quality of life. Um, and frequently they provide an infrastructure at a scale that would not be commercially viable uh, if it had to be paid for privately. So think water, think roads, think sewer, um, even education. It, it's a massive scale infrastructure problem. And we are seeing that um, as the common denominators to the infrastructure uh, kind of tease themselves out and we see things like fiber, we see things like wireless, uh, cities will definitely be in the business of laying down that common shared infrastructure which will then allow the communities to build economically on top of that. So within the city of Atlanta, we've done um, three things that you've heard already mentioned here. Um, we have, uh, we, we like to call it democratizing the data. We've taken um, access to that legacy data that was previously mentioned um, in Mika's conversation, and we're starting to open it up in a very similar process to what OneTransport.io did as well, where we take that data, we make it available as an API, and we try to make it as frictionless as possible, knowing that the data itself may have marginal value, but the recombination of that data with other data sources is where the real economic growth and explosion is going to take place. Hence our desire to democratize that data. We don't see a city typically as the one that will develop that amazing app, uh, but we do see cities as critical to releasing and freeing that data so that someone else can create that app that will ignite potential. The second thing that we're doing, and we have actually on the street as we speak an active RFP for this, is looking at major, making major infrastructure investments so that not only can the city operate more efficiently uh, as, as an agency itself, but also taking spare capacity in that infrastructure and making it more readily available for people to build an economy on top of as well. We like to refer to it as digital assets that previously didn't exist or were infeasible, but now seeing connectivity, seeing uh, sensor capability, seeing communication channels, uh, available spectrum, that sort of thing being laid down as a common infrastructure is something that we're key to. And then the third piece that we're doing in Atlanta that's uh, really, really critical, and I think where you're going to see the vast majority of the growth is in facilitating that interface between business and the city. Again, I don't think cities in the future will get out of their primary business of delivering reliable, consistent services. So they will have to have a bedrock mentality, um, but they also have to be able to flex to address the immediate concerns and needs of the economic community that they are supporting. And I think we've seen a, a wonderful success, and I've seen it in other cities as mentioned, the economic development arms of those cities get the mission and objective of developing an economy. And in the case of Atlanta, we're working directly with them to make sure that the companies that want to build on top of our common infrastructure are able to do so. They've got policies that are friendly towards that development, that they have access to the information and data that they need for the development and also they understand what the challenges are of the larger community, uh, which is something we don't often talk about, but the insights that the city has in making those available to the vendor community is really critical so that needs can be addressed and the economy can improve from it. Uh, there's a lot of different directions we could go, but I think in the interest of time, we wanted to reserve some uh, Q&A time, so I'm gonna hand it back over to Ben at this point. Great, uh, thank you so much, Kirk, and everyone else as well. Uh, let's get to the Q&A while we have time. As a reminder, please, please, please any questions, any questions. Us to answer via the platform and indicate the panelists towards whom you're directing them, if applicable. 
So one question for Mika, what data is Cordon's data marketplace monetizing and who sets the price? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, so um, uh, the, the public sector data that's currently in one transport, that's basically uh, for free. So the public sector entities position in the new place that they don't, uh, they don't want to charge uh, money for, for the data sets because they've been uh, uh, brought up using public money. The private sector entities or companies data is typically uh, for a fee, and they're, 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 let's say the best example is like floating car data, which is uh, something that uh, typically mobile operators collect, as well as uh, various different uh, app application or consent based, uh, based solutions. Um, the second part of the question was about who sets the price. So, one transport app acts as a neutral broker so we don't set the price but the price is always set by the data owner so whoever uh, publishes data through uh, one transport system uh, has the all the rights to set the price for the data to whatever they want it to be then it's the market that dictates whether there's demand for it or not great um, and this question is for Dominic. Uh, what can cities do for the economic development of their more impoverished areas? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's a key role for cities. It's one thing to drive economic growth uh, for the city as a whole. It's quite another thing to do it evenly. I think the big thing here is digital inclusion, pulling in every citizen through uh, smart kiosks, I think Verizon does a lot about that, and the city of New York, uh, portals, smartphone apps, free Wi-Fi, everything that can pull a uh, citizen into the economic circle of influence. It's also about providing, you know, uh, very affordable mobility, maybe through public partnerships with uh, ride-sharing companies that then would serve, you know, all the areas of the cities, not just where they can make most money. The other thing, uh, equally important, is education. We're moving to, you know, in a, a technological era where AI and automation becomes more important. Education is critical to pull people into the new types of jobs that are being created as we speak. Uh, affordable, uh, remote learning, whatever it, it takes to offer that kind of education to the entire city. Um, and, and maybe finally, you know, looking at employment, even for those that might still not be able to join that, that employment uh, uh, kind of paradigm, uh, might also be important to look at alternative job creation outside of official employment. And there's a talk about universal income, there's talk about new self-employment paradigm. So I think cities also need to think about maybe putting regulation and legislation in place to also think about those new forms of employment as well. Thanks, Tom. And uh, with this, uh, Kirk, along those same lines, would Atlanta ever look to monetize any data or are they willing to share it for the benefit of the citizens? So we've spent a fair amount of time looking at that question and the answer as dodgy as it sounds is actually both. There is a component of the data that we generate that is absolutely publicly available and should be publicly available. It's taxpayer dollars. However, in the cases where companies are looking to monetize and to capitalize on that data to resell it, then it absolutely makes sense for the city to participate in that. And we've been exploring ways that we can both give data for commercial purposes and participate in that commercialization, as well as giving variations of that data away for free. Uh, so that's one of our big focuses here in 2018. Great. Oh, and then for uh, Bill, what are some implementation guidelines and operate, operationalization checklists to help with economic development? Thanks for that question, Ben. So, I mean, I think one thing to look at is um, uh, some of the studies that previously have focused on uh, the impact that broadband networks have for communities. Uh, in particular, at uh, US Ignite, we like to look at the examples of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Lafayette, Louisiana. They establish sort of the um, pathway 
from investments in technology um, to uh, increases in real estate uh, development activity, increases in entrepreneurialism. Uh, there's a, a valuable study by the Kauffman Foundation focused on Chattanooga uh, that, that highlights that link. Uh, I think that the, the topic that we're talking about today, the connectivity, the, the sensors, the analytics, and then the application layer, this is the new uh, you know, area that needs to be studied. I think the ABI study helps establish these links. But we can look at the studies that have been done before to establish, you know, the reasons that we, uh, you know, as community residents and as municipal leaders move uh, to uh, move to make these investments. Great. And uh, this question is from Mika. Venues are one example of economic development. For smart cities, what are some other examples where an open data marketplace can help? And what we are seeing, seeing is on top of the transportation space, basically, uh, we're seeing social services being a big space in the cities, that obviously it's a big chunk of budgets in, in, in many of the big cities, and, uh, and, and the potential to use data to, to more efficiently deliver those services uh, is high on the agenda on, on a lot of different cities. So there we see the potential with the with the open data marketplace and or, or, or the approach of, uh, of being able to utilize different data sets over different departments, over different entities uh, to, to have a high potential. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And I think this would be a really great question to, uh, from the audience to end it up and for everyone and just kind of get maybe everyone's high level thoughts on this. Um, so I'll just start with um, Dom, then go to Bill, go to Kirk, and then end with Mika. Uh, so how do, how do the, the availability of unlicensed spectrum, spectrum such as CBRS to impact smart city infrastructure solutions and connectivity? Yeah, I think, yeah, let me start. This is Dom here. Um, anything a city can do to make available uh, Connectivity at, at the lower price point using unlicensed spectrum, I think, is, is a great opportunity. Um, it's also, I think, from a capacity point of view, you know, when the public networks uh, might struggle to provide uh, connectivity during events, and et cetera, et cetera, having that unlicensed spectrum uh, being explored and, and used is, is, is also very important, I would say. Uh, yes, this is Bill McGuire from US Ignite. Uh, I certainly agree with Dom's assessment that um, you know, the vision we have for the smart and connected community is an all-in uh, approach. Um, so whereas as an organization, we really had a focus on fiber uh, when we founded, were founded six years ago, um, we recognize now that different use cases are going to uh, uh, take advantage of different technologies uh, we continue to believe that fiber is going to play a central role and that communities that invest in fiber uh, will, will always find that investment to be valuable. Uh, but wireless clearly has a role and unlicensed spectrum because as Don mentioned, uh, will make some of these, um, make, make the cost associated with providing wireless connectivity uh, potentially lower will definitely have a role. Uh, and we see some of that, you know, sort of excitement around the machine queue deployments, um, you know, sort of utilizing unlicensed spectrum already. So um, we, we think it's, it's definitely going to be an all-in answer for the smart cities. Um, I, th I think I would probably echo what Dom said that from a city perspective, unlicensed spectrum by its very nature is not something that's being centrally controlled. Therefore, we would see it and we would probably encourage uh, utilization of very localized applications and um, solutions around wireless or unlicensed, but it probably would not be coordinated at a city level. Well, great. Thanks, everyone. I think that's a great place to wrap up the webinar. I want to thank our presenters for spending some time with us today and for all of our audience members for participating in this event. 
Again, you'll be receiving an email with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation once it's available. Take care and we'll talk to you all soon.